Well, it's getting time to move on from wireless to some other really interesting topics. But before we leave, let's have a little chat about MIMO, or MIMO, and OFDM, or Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiplexing. All right, friends and neighbors, welcome back to another networking video, another wireless networking video. Today, we are going to talk about OFDM and MIMO or MIMO. So that's orthogonal frequency division multiplexing and multiple in, multiple out. I'll apologize in advance for my voice, but I'll try to make myself understood. Ah, the good old days. So... Before 802.11n and AC and AD and all of these other standards, uh, there was 802.11, 802.11b, A, and G. And they sort of all shared really one thing in common. That is that whatever was going on on a particular channel, that's what was going on. So that means that whether you're doing direct sequence spread spectrum with the chipping code or whether you're doing frequency hopping spread spectrum with a Gaussian frequency shift keying there's really one transmission per channel and the big deal was that the channel size changed from you know very very small channels to 5 megahertz channels on up to 20 megahertz channels and then a little more complicated encoding scheme but we had a top speed of 54 meg and that seemed to be one of the limits that we kept running into uh, there was only one radio. So even if you had an access point that was 2.4 or 2.5 where they added a second radio, you weren't able to combine them. So you had an SSID that might run at 2.4 and an SSID that might run at 5, but that was pretty much it. And a really good indication that you're living in that stone age was that you had two antennas. That's about it. So the question is, how do today's networks get to the much higher speeds that we experience? So one of the most significant advancements was orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. And the whole idea here is that instead of dedicating the entire channel bandwidth to a single carrier or a single, I'll say, data stream, what we do instead is chop it up and then use lots of subcarriers. Now, if you've never really uh, looked into carriers. A carrier wave is a sinusoidal waveform. It's an analog wave, a radio wave, that we use as the base for a signal. And then we modulate it. We change the amplitude, we change the phase, we change the frequency to convey ones and zeros. Well, in this case, we're going to use a lot of carriers, called subcarriers, and each one is going to carry a part of the data. Now, just like channels are protected from each other by a guard band in between, the subcarriers are also protected by a guard band in between all of them. So, when you apply a subcarrier and you increase the modulation on each subcarrier, so each subcarrier is carrying 300K or something like that, then you can get an increase in the data rate over the course of a channel. So even if a subcarrier is destroyed, the rest are not. Now, you can always back off to simpler encoding schemes. You can advance things to go more complex, but that's the basic idea behind OFDM. I guess it's also worth noting that within OFDM, there are advancements as well. So the original OFDM that came out in 802.11n had a certain number of subcarriers, a certain data rate per subcarrier, and guard band of a particular size. But if you can take the subcarriers and increase the data rate on them, shrink the guard bands, increase the number of subcarriers, you get increases in data rate. And that's one of the big advances that we see even within the OFDM space. All right, so what is MIMO, MIMO? Well, it's multiple in, multiple out. And the whole idea here is that let's say that we were talking about a Linksys access point or a Cisco access point and you see two antennas and that's it. That means that that access point had one radio and that radio flipped back and forth between transmit and receive. So what would be one method that we could use to increase the data rate? Well, what if we had more than one radio operating on the same channel sending more data. And that's really the big deal behind MIMO. So 
what we do is we're going to take advantage of spatial streams. And a spatial stream is simply this. If I have a couple of radios, right, I can send one copy of the data and then another copy of the data and then another copy of the data. It's very common to talk about two or three spatial streams. Now what happens if I send the same thing on three different radios? What I do at the receiver is I collect all those. They're the exact same data, but I can reduce my error rate. I can improve my signal to noise ratio by combining them and filling in the holes. The example that I always give is, you know, somebody that's delivering mail on a, the Pony Express, right? Delivering mail and rain, sleet, storms, desert, Gila monsters, all of those things. And eventually the letter gets there and you go, oh my goodness, what happened to this thing? But if I had three Pony Express riders all carrying the same letter, they would all be damaged, but we could put the letters together and go, oh, I think we understand more. All right, so that's one way that we could go about um, using the spatial streams. And that works really well when you're trying to increase the distance, maybe, or when you're in a high noise environment. Another way to go is to say, well, we're in a pretty good environment. What if we wanted to increase the data rate? And in that case, what we're going to do is we're going to take one of our spatial streams and send data packet one. And in the other spatial stream, we're going to send data packet two. And if we have three, we can send another chunk of data. Well, in that way, clearly, we're increasing the data rate through the channel because we're not sending copies. So those are really the two main uses for um, the spatial streams. Now, there are other related ideas like beam forming, you know, focusing on a particular node or a particular transmission uh, and advances in the, what we call the demodulation. And that's really improving the signal to noise ratio. And that, in a nutshell, is multiple in, multiple out. Now, a really important idea is the modulation itself. So, if you're talking about trying to convey ones and zeros, so right up there I've got ones and zeros, right, the square wave. Well, one way to do that would be with amplitude shift keying, or ASK. And you can see that the, the amplitude of the waveform grows or shrinks depending on whether or not it's a one or a zero. So that's a very simplistic form of conveying ones and zeros. We can do the same thing with frequencies and we can do the same thing with phase. Today, we usually combine phase changes and amplitude changes for quadrature amplitude modulation or QAM. That is by far the, the most popular encoding technique that we have. Now, when we improve our modulation, when we want to increase the data rate, we have to have a more complex modulation scheme. So I've given you a couple examples over there or over there. Anyway, the, the constellation diagrams. So the first one is 16 QAM. And what that's showing you is that there are a couple of different amplitudes. So if you look along the x-axis and then start to move through the degrees, right? 22 and a half, 45, and so on you can see that on that line there would be a dot and that dot would have an amplitude associated with it. The shifting of the phase, which means changing the temporal relationship between one symbol and the next or the signal change and the next, that is the angle. All right, so 16 qualm, pretty straightforward, right? We've got a couple of phases that we use, a couple of degrees, right? Uh, and then a couple of different amplitudes. If we go to 32 qualm, you can see that the constellation diagram starts to get more complex. Now, 32 qualm means that you have 32 possible signal changes, and that now, instead of conveying, say, 4 bits per symbol or 4 bits per baud, in 16 qualm, you're now moving to 5 bits. So every time you see one of those dots, it's 5 bits of data. 64 qualm, even crazier. Today, we do 256 quam. So there are lots and lots of improvements in the modulation that you can do if you're in a good signal environment. Now, the minute you try to go faster or more complex and something goes wrong, then access points and nodes can automatically back off when their error rates start to go up and they can't understand the data. But that is probably a good place to start if you're gonna to try to understand modulation Take a look at ASK, PSK, and then QAM. And don't forget your constellation diagrams.
So today we're at pretty impressive speeds, right? Uh, wireless is trying to compete with wired connections. There may come a day when end nodes are not connected to jacks or ports at all. So in the speed arms race, it's always a question, how fast can we go? As I mentioned earlier, one of the ways that we can go faster is simply by upping the complexity of the modulation scheme. And that's, and our ability to do that is limited by the electronics ability to pick up those, those tiny phase changes or amplitude changes and separate them or distinguish them between the other signal changes. One of the other things that we, we can do is we take 20 megahertz channels and we can bond them together with another channel for 40 megahertz. Now, if you're in 2.4 gigahertz, you're somewhat limited, right? We have 100 megahertz worth of bandwidth. And so you can really bond together a couple of channels and that's it. So it's very common to see if you're doing channel bonding at 2.4, one big fat channel, sometimes two. And that's why we don't often do channel bonding at 2.4. Now at 5 gigahertz, and actually remember it's 5 gigahertz on almost to 6 gigahertz, we actually have 300 megahertz worth of bandwidth. So the way that works is that there's two chunks of 100 megahertz low, 5.125 uh, gigahertz to 5.2.5 or 5.25, and then 5.25 to 5.35, and then all the way up 5.725 to 5.825. Let me see if I said that right. 5.15 to 5.25, 5.25 .25 to 5.35, 5.725 gigahertz to 5.825. So those are the unlicensed or the UNII bands. So that actually accounts for 300 megahertz. And so you could actually do quite a bit of channel bonding up there and not worry about limiting the other capacity. So it's very common to see um, networks run at 2.4 and 5 gigahertz at the same time and or multiple SSIDs for the same organization. Channel bonding in five gigahertz, no channel bonding at two. Another thing that we can do in those subcarriers is, so we increase the data rate of the subcarriers, we shrink the distance between the subcarriers. Those are the guard bands and increase the number of subcarriers. So those are two other ways that we can go faster and they're constantly figuring out how to engineer those. Now, one of the other fights today is over spectrum, right? So if you read anything from the FCC or you talk about all of the all of the allocations for wireless communications that are not actually being used very often, there's this constant battle to allocate more and more bandwidth to unlicensed and to licensed providers. And so as that goes forward, we may see 802.11 or unlicensed data transmissions at a variety of frequencies beyond the current ISM and UNII bands. By the way, just as a reminder, in the ISM band, we also have a 900 megahertz chunk, which is why we do cordless phones there. Now you can always add more radios and more antennas. We can have more spatial streams. So sometimes we'll even see four by four. Now imagine you've got access points festooned with uh, antennas and more and more radios. They'll get more expensive, right? But you could have more spatial streams. All right, so this has been a talk about OFDM and multiple in, multiple out. These are really, really important ideas to understand when you were looking at moving 802.11 networks ahead. But certainly, if you're going to understand you know, what OFDM is, then you got to really sort of drill down, see maybe where we were before and what's happening on an individual carrier in terms of the modulation, guard bands, and things like that. Now, these ideas are not restricted to 802.11. We use them many, many other places, too, because they're just awesome ideas and they work really well. Well, hopefully you enjoyed this last video on the wireless series, at least for now. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Hey, like and subscribe if I helped. And may those wireless packets always reach their destination no matter what spatial stream they're traveling over.